Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Today, we are exploring the beautiful and complex island called the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and one of its most celebrated poets, Julia de Burgos. We're excited for many reasons to be celebrating this beautiful place and its cultural and social and creative contribution to our world. Uh, The first and obvious being uh, it is an enchanting place with mountains and beaches and uh, an expression of the paradise kind of associated with the entirety of the Caribbean. But it also goes without saying that every place is unique, and Puerto Rico is uh, different than even its closest neighbors, the Dominican Republic, uh, Haiti, or even Cuba. But for many around the world, Puerto Rico is a mystery. For one thing, it remains politically controversial, and although there is no one who argues about its beauty or music, politically speaking, it is often misunderstood. Some people think that it's an independent country, others think it's an American state, and uh, and although it is part of the United States, both of these understandings are not correct. Um, it is what today we would call a protectorate. Well, that's a word you don't hear very much, and to me is a slightly ambiguous. True, um, and there are those that suggest it's a euphemism for a far more negative and uh, older word, colony. Uh, And although it's impossible to talk about the politics of Puerto Rico without getting a little controversial, we want to represent uh, as best we can the views of the people who live there, even though uh, that is obviously not just one perspective. Uh, So to use the language of the sea, I hope we can navigate today's (laughs) discussion respectfully, honoring Puerto Rico's many voices but more specifically, the voice of Julia de Burgos, who really did in her work attempt to give voice to her homeland. Well, since you're introducing the water-based uh, imagery, I'm, uh, I'll join the fun, throw caution to the wind, and plunge into the Caribbean Sea and explore with you this enchanting uh, island. <laughs> is it a pun war? Are we going to go adrift with storm references here? Oh, I might be treading water with my poetry here as we're getting ready to read. But it's in the spirit of an homage. Did you get the treading water line? Uh, Yeah, I did not miss that. (laughs) It's interesting to note that the island is small. I mean, it's only 111 miles, the main one, from one side to the other. But no question that... The best things do come in small packages. <laughs> I, are you speaking from personal experience? I so am. As a woman of small stature, but great strength and diversity, I will testify that's the truth. <laughs> uh, I guess I won't disagree with that. <laughs> you better not. <laughs> and, and let me say that the width of the main island is even smaller than that. It's only 39 miles wide. But in spite of the its small geography, the history of Puerto Rico situates the island and its people inside a very complicated, ongoing global narrative. Uh, Starting with the Spanish explorers that arrived in the 16th century, people from all corners of the world have arrived on these shores, bringing uh, with them a wide range of understandings of who they are, what their relationship is with other people, and even what their relationship to God should be. Uh, This concentration of cultures and worldviews uh, has brought with it a lot of turbulence and a lot of power struggle in a small space, uh, making Puerto Rico unique, even among its neighbors. Well, very much so. In Puerto Rican culture, it diffuses Spanish, American, African, and Caribbean cultures into a beautiful mixed heritage. And while obviously no island resident would suggest there's not scars or even open wounds because of its difficult past, there's something beautiful and promising in the spirit of the island. And so this week, we do want to honor and highlight a Puerto Rican poet who absolutely embodies every bit of what you're talking about. Huda de Borges was born on February 17 of 1914, but she died July 6, 1953, still a very young woman, aged 39. She was ambitious, brilliant, ahead of her time, and she experienced and talked openly about issues that honestly dominate political and social discourse now, but at her time were really not openly discussed. And then there's that political side of her, but on a personal side, 
there's a very real sense as you read her work that she was trying to unwrap her understanding of what it meant to be a global citizen, a professional, a woman. In all three of these ways, she stressed the social and religious norms of her family, her community, and really the world. She was born into the culture of Puerto Rico, but was an expatriate living in New York by the time she was 25, and she remained an expat all the way until her death. She was always very sure and certain of her political drive, but her pursuit of personal identity was, I don't know, maybe you could use the word slightly more troubled, at least that's how I would describe it. Having said that, when you read her work, you can see so much political passion, a passion for her nation, Uh, but it's not really an autobiographical book. It's not really a memoir type writing so much so. The words and the images that she uses, although they do express her view of the world and they employ the beauty of her homeland, she really does try to extend it outward into a more global conversation. We've talked about this with so many authors, but she takes the particulars of her Puerto Rican experience and applies those ideas really to the world at large. Uh, Oh, and there's one more thing that you'll like. Uh, There's so much passion and sensuality. It is, by the way, Latin. So that's something to look forward to. (laughs) Oh, my. Look out. What's so impressive about her work is that it aged well. It was actually well-received during her lifetime, but after she died, it's only grown in popularity. Uh, Some would say, well, that's because the world is more open now to a broader range of writers, and obviously that's true. But I would suggest that because her feelings are about things that we talk more openly about today, it keeps her work really current. In 2010, the U.S. Postal Service selected to put her image on a postage stamp. So it's nice to see that this woman, the culture and struggle that she loved and represented, has been honored in such an appropriate way. I mean, a postage stamp takes words around the world, and nothing could be more appropriate for Julia. So Gary... I know you can tell that I'm excited about this special episode this week. So let's jump in. Uh, Ocean pun. uh, (laughs) Excited to listen to what you have to tell us about the history of this uh, amazing place. Well, okay. I guess we're ready for the dive. Oh, shall we say? (laughs) (laughs) Well, anchors away. Let's get started. Okay. Uh, what a lot of people don't know about Puerto Rico is that it is the oldest colony on planet Earth, four centuries under Spain. And depending on how you define the relationship today, some would argue uh, now even a century under the United States. And it was a strategic trade link in the area. So even though it didn't have a lot of minerals like gold uh, to entice those original conquistadors, the Spanish built several forts and things like that on the island. But jumping ahead from the conquistadors and the Spanish. This little place became a focal point during the Spanish-American War, which is a war most people really don't know much about in the United States. And it's when Teddy Roosevelt, uh, before he became president, and he can be quoted as saying to uh, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, I earnestly hope that no truce will be granted and that peace will only be made on consideration of Cuba being independent, Puerto Rico ours, And the Philippines taken away from Spain. Ouch. Well, I mean, (laughs) this is imperialistic language, which today would be considered scandalous. But why are Spain and the U.S. arguing about who will own what today we would consider places that pertain to people groups far from their own homeland? Uh, We don't identify or or much less agree with the imperialism as it expressed itself in the last, last century. And it was you know, pretty brazen and bold in its objectives. And today, the relationship between politics and economics is much more blurred. Um, I want to venture to say we're much more comfortable with this kind of aggressive imperialistic language coming from the mouths of CEOs of companies, uh, more so than presidents of countries. The world was very different back then. And remember, this was before both world wars. But all of a sudden, in 1898, conflict has arrived in Puerto Rico. Well, I have to be honest. I'm one of those people. I don't think I know maybe anything about the war, if I even knew there was one, between the United States and Spain. Well, let me take the next couple of hours to discuss it. (laughs) No, I'm 
not interested. Oh, you want the short version? <laughs> I think so. Okay, well, I could say a lot about that because that was basically the result of a, a lot of fake news and hysteria on the part of Hearst and Pulitzer, uh, little of which had really anything to do with Puerto Rico directly. But suffice it to say, in 1898, it finds itself caught between the forces of a couple of major superpowers. And the end result was that uh, the United States actually invaded Puerto Rico in 1898. Oh my gosh. The military campaign lasted only 19 days. And when the Americans arrived on the beaches, there was really almost no resistance. And there were only seven casualties. And the island had been a colony of Spain and no one felt compelled to defend it. Uh, there were so many residents of the island living in abject poverty. As Machiavelli told us in the 1600s, Regular people just want to live without oppression, and the poverty was oppressive. And many people in Puerto Rico were hoping to find an improvement in their standard of living with the change in regime. You know, less oppression, less hunger. That's how we would translate that. Uh, maybe the Americans will give us a better deal than the Spanish. Well, to be honest, I did look into this a little bit, and I did find out that with the collapse of the Spanish regime, there were some positive Changes. One that caught my eye was the separation of church and state, which meant for women, all of a sudden, divorce was legal. And lots of women moved to take advantage of that benefit almost immediately. I know, when you think about it, <laughs> we're in the middle of uh, a collapse in the empire crisis. And what's the best thing to happen? Divorce! <laughs> the women are thinking, divorce, we can get out. Anyway, uh, true, and not just women, uh, lots of workers begin to mobilize in an attempt to get better conditions for workers in all areas, the farmers, uh, the dock workers, um, artisans, construction workers. Everyone was hoping for a better life. But, of course, again, as Machiavelli warns us, the elites are always trying to oppress. No and, doubt. And that happened here, too. Uh, the sugar interests had a lot of power. The mill owners, the cane growers, and all of these uh, interests also mobilized. And the other big interest uh, industry in uh, Puerto Rico is coffee. The coffee industry uh, also had its challenges under Spanish rule. And they were hopeful that the American market would help boost them. Not necessarily for improved conditions for workers, but uh, an improved deal for the coffee plantation growers. Well, I have um, committed myself to supporting the coffee industry. <laughs> Every morning. <laughs> yeah. Well, why does that matter? I mean, sugar and, you know, coffee. Well, it matters because the overwhelming majority of the population of Puerto Rico consists of the rural poor. And almost everyone in Puerto Rico was living in a situation where they didn't have schools, they didn't have health care, shoes, or even enough to eat. And many spent their days working hard in the fields. But the money they generated through the crops they were producing really never got back to their families, not as cash and not in the form of public schools or social services of any kind. Uh, this was the world as it presented itself to the family of Julia de Borgos. The outside world was engaging in political events beyond their control. But for the de Borgos family, like for most of the residents of this island, that stuff didn't matter. They didn't know anything or, or even care anything about uh, the United States expanding republic or the Forker Act or anything like that. Uh, they needed help surviving, and they were looking for someone to raise the standard of living for all the residents and to provide food for the 14 children in oh their household. Gosh. Let me give you another detail to further com compound and illustrate the reality of most people at the turn of the century in Puerto Rico. Many of us remember in 2017 that uh, Hurricane Maria that devastated Puerto Rico. For sure. And hopefully you saw pictures and maybe contributed financially to the efforts to help. But if you remember, the hurricane devastated the island. And even though today Puerto Rico is more modern and has more infrastructure than in earlier days, Still close to 3,000 people died, and they estimate that $90 billion worth of damage occurred. Well, in 1928, Hurricane San Felipe, the second and or equally even more devastating storm, hit the island. They tell us that not a single building was untouched on the entire island. Um, in uh, De Burgos' town of Carolina, lots of people died. Hundreds of thousands were left absolutely homeless. Julia would have been 13 years old when that hurricane hit, and the devastation would have been greater than that of today. Yeah, I guess those of us who are landlocked don't 
think about those kinds of issues. But that takes us to De Burgos' story directly. You mentioned that she was born in the town of Catalina and that she was born to a very poor household. You know, Catalina is a nice sized town, but and it has some nice places, but that wasn't De Burgos' reality. She lived in a poor area of the town. And you mentioned she was the oldest of 13 children. And let me add that six of her younger siblings died of malnutrition. So that just gives us a small picture of the struggle of her early days that is forming her worldview. In Julia's childhood, there wasn't that feeling of hope for the future and optimism. That wasn't happening for everyone around this, you know, hurricane-torn, starved community. But, you know, in Julia's case, she got a break. She was lucky. She was awarded a scholarship to attend an elementary school. Julia was the only member of her family to get an opportunity like this, and she performed extremely well. She graduated from the Munoz Rivera Primary School and then got a scholarship again to attend a high school in a neighboring town. But in order to be able to do that, her entire family would have to move, and they did. They moved to a place called Rio Piedras, and from there, she was eventually able to enroll in the University of P- Puerto Rico. So it's all impressive, really, and it's hard to imagine, you know, the kind of effort that her entire family would have had to make to create this possibility for her. But she came through, and by the time she was 19, if you think about this, she'd already earned a teaching degree and was working as an elementary school teacher. So as you can see, you know, things are moving up, and as an adult, she gets more involved in city life, and Because she gets more involved in city life, she becomes interested in the political scene of her country, and she gets involved with the independence movement. She became a journalist, and she started to write poetry, and she openly and actively participated in the political scene. So, Gary, what does that mean for Puerto Ricans at this time? I mean, I understand that they're under American rule, and this was some things that some residents wanted and others opposed. True. And, and this is where I cannot speak for the people of Puerto Rico. And uh, it's it's most often asked question in regard to the people of Puerto Rico, even to this day. And what is the best political organization for this island? Um, all residents want higher standards of living, better access to everything, less human suffering. But what political situation gives people the best chance for that? That is where the consensus ends. Um, is Puerto Rico better off independent or is it better to have this protectorate relationship with the United States? Is Puerto Rico better off as a state like Hawaii or Alaska or any of the other American states that on the continent? Burgos uh, felt very strongly that Puerto Rico should be independent. And she ran in circles that openly advocated for independence and were actively organizing people to support that cause. And um, there was a Harvard trained lawyer named Petro Albizu Campos who led a cane cutter strike in 1934 uh, that was a close associate of de Burgos. And she even wrote about him in her poetry. He was a revolutionary and was charged by the United States government with seditious conspiracy and eventually spent 30 years incarcerated. And this enraged Julia. In fact, there was a lot of things like this going on during the time period that really stung the minds and hearts of uh, many in Puerto Rico, no matter what position they took on the issue of independence. And during Julia's days in Puerto Rico, there were a lot of riots. And I saw one quote from the newspaper, the Independista, where um, a woman was quoted saying, My mother left in a white dress and came home in a red dress. There was unrest. There were also economic problems that were escalating. Unemployment was grew by 30 percent between the years 1930 and 1933, the Great Depression years. And uh, this rise in poverty was close to home for Julia. She took a job working for the Puerto Rico Emergency Relief Agency, distributing food to suffering people. And de Burgos was very active, and this was fairly unusual for a woman at this time period, even even a highly educated woman. And unlike many women intellectuals who were her peers, she was very articulate and vocal with her political views. 
Well, I will say that de Burgos talked about these riots in her poetry and these words in describing the death of Bolivar Marquez, who is another man shot at an event. She says this, your blood is planted in a thousand living signs. And this is just an example of the things that you'll see when you read her poetry. And as you look at it, uh, through a political lens, it's helpful to understand uh, this kind of world that she's talking about. I mean, she talked and organized workers through her poem, Es Nuestra La Hora, which translates in, ours is the hour. It's obvious to anyone that during de Burgos' years in Puerto Rico that her heart and her work and her efforts were really for the betterment of her homeland. And although there may have been those who disagreed with her political goals as to what was the best for Puerto Rico, no one could ever doubt her sincerity and her passion and her work ethic toward her goals. And um, This is also around the time that she met and married her first husband, a man by the name of Ruben Rodriguez Beauchamp. Well, this is where I want to drop in the first poem of hers that I'd like to read. It's by far her most famous poem, and it was written during these years when she's young and involved in this struggle for Puerto Rican independence. And really, it was her breakout poem. She's only 21 when it's published, and it launched for her a career because people of note noticed her. And she transitioned from this little girl from the suburbs into something much larger. She was getting visibility. She was elected as the Secretary General of the Daughters of Freedom. She got invited to speak, and she spoke at rapidly. Alleys. And although for us, when you read her most famous and really it's the, the most anthologized poem that she has, uh, we may not think of it as exceptionally political, especially when it's translated into English. You can read it various ways, uh, but it is. And the poem involves a small child drawn toward a mysterious body of water. And the child is speaking to the river, the river that she grew up with. And you can read this poem as a tribute to the river that it empties into the sea. And it's a tribute to the landscape for sure, but it's way more layered than that. Uh, there's this image of a creation myth of the origins of Puerto Rico talking for the first time, the beginning of time. But when you drop it into the context of what's going on during her life story, you know, it, it just reads more, I don't know, political. It, there's just a lot more intensity to it. Here's a child who wants to lose herself in the river's rivulets and kind of like a young country wanting to be lost from imperialism and in her poem, she calls the greatest of her island's tears those that come from the eyes of my soul for my enslaved people. By the way, there's also a lot of sensual imagery which blends and intensifies the creation myth as it kind of uh, blends with the violence of the political story of Puerto Rico. Pay attention, this is especially obvious in the last stanza. Another helpful way for me to read this poem is to remember that it's Latin in nature. And there's, although it's not considered, you know, an expression of magical realism, I certainly see a lot of magical elements in it and a lot of allegorical elements in it that we associate today with magical realism. And if you're not familiar with that term, we've talked about it a couple times. Uh, think Tim Burton and his movies, you know, these magical, bright, allegorical colors that, um, kind of overwhelm your senses. That's but emotional at the same time. That's kind of how you are going to experience the way that she writes. And I'm telling you all this on the front end because I don't want to stop. You know, sometimes I do that stanza by stanza and explain every uh, every stanza, but I don't want to do that. I want to read it completely at, at one one read. So think of the colors. Pay attention to the strong colors: blue, dark, red nude white flesh that turns you black. They're strong. These are images of violence. She's trying to reflect the slaughter of the indigenous people, the legacy of slavery. So remember also that this is an English translation. Sometimes we miss the lyricism whenever we translate things from one language to another. But in her case, the power is in the imagery and that definitely translates. So with all that introduction... 
Yes, and, and I want to give this little uh, caveat before you jump into it and remind all of our listeners that uh, you were raised in Brazil in a Latin culture, so you do have more than the average insight to this. <laughs> well, uh, let's read it together. I think everybody will see and, and feel and experience uh, the emotion uh, of de Borges. So this, this poem is called Big River of Luisa. Rio Grande de Luisa, elongate yourself and my spirit and let my soul lose itself in your rivulets, finding the fountain that robbed you as a child and in a crazed impulse returns you to the path. Coil yourself upon my lips and let me drink you to feel you mine for a brief moment to hide you from the world and hide you in yourself, to hear astonished voices in the mouth of the wind Dismount for a moment from the loin of the earth and search for the intimate secret in my desires. Confuse yourself in the flight of my bird fantasy and leave a rose of water in my dreams. Rio Grande de Luisa, my wellspring, my river, since the maternal petal lifted me to the world, my pale desires came down in you from the craggy hills to find new furrows, and my childhood was all a poem in the river, a river in the poem of my first dreams. Adolescence arrived. Life surprised me, pinned to the widest part of your eternal voyage, and I was yours a thousand times, and in a beautiful romance, you awoke my soul and kissed my body. Where did you take the waters that bathed my body in a sun blossom recently opened? Who knows on what remote Mediterranean shore some fawn shall be possessing me? Who knows in what rainfall of what far land I shall be spilling to open new furrows, or perhaps, tired of biting hearts, I shall be freezing in icicles. Rio Grande de Luisa, blue, brown, red, blue mirror, fallen piece of blue sky, naked white flesh that turns black each time the night enters your bed, red stripe of blood when the rain falls in torrents and the hills vomit their mud, man river, but man with the purity of river, because you give your blue soul when you give your blue kiss, most sovereign river mine, man river, the only man who has kissed my soul upon kissing my body. Rio Grande de Luisa, great river, great flood of tears, the greatest of all our island's tears, save those greater that come from the eyes of my soul for my enslaved people." What do you think of that, Gary? I know it's kind of hard to follow when you're just listening to it for the first time, but I find her poetry readable. It's something I think you can follow by just listening. It is, and it is extremely sensuous. And by that, I mean not uh, not just uh, intimately, uh, but in, in terms of her tears and everything else. You know, all those sensations are really built into this. Well, they are, and you can feel her emotion, her passion for the place where she was raised and, and the beauty that she finds there and, and the sadness that she finds there, too. I have another one that I want to read. It's also quite famous. It's called To Julia. And the second poem that I want to read, it's unique because Julia writes to herself. It's very relatable to many issues that you know, we hear all the time young people talking about today, but it's well before it's time. In this poem, the speaker dramatizes the conflict that she finds between her socially acceptable constructed identity and this inner voice that she sees as very different, more artistic, really. In the poem, the one Julia, you know, has this conflict and maybe wants to get rid of the other Julia. There's this internal battle Maybe if what she sees is a true self, a more honest self versus her false self, this is the side of her work that although, of course, it's obviously still political, uh, it struggles more intimately with issues of identity. And when we read these kinds of poems, we do feel a personal, a much more personal connection to her that lots of poetry doesn't communicate. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I'd said this before, but she wrote around 150 poems and not just poetry, although that's what she's most famous for. There's a lot of letters published that she wrote, a lot of essays. There's a lot of articles, you know, that people still read that she wrote. 
Uh, so I do want to read this second poem to Julia, but before, I also want to provide the context for it by giving some details of her life. I don't know, we don't have time to go through all the details, but I think it lends empathy when we understand her as a person. So Gary, what do you want to tell us about the rest of her story? Well, first of all, you know I love context. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> because we've always said these authors didn't write out of nothing. They wrote oh. out, of, out of their their experience. And uh, there's a couple of events, but also some life choices that Burgos made uh, around the age of 24 that really significantly changed the direction of her life. First, her mother had died of cancer just a couple of years before. Uh, she'd been sick for a while, and Julia had spent every earned dollar she had trying to sustain her life and literally going from town to town peddling her books. Her death was really a blow. And also, a little later, she fell in love with a man by the name of Juan Grulon. She had divorced her husband after being married only three years, but uh, being a divorced woman in Puerto Rican society was not well received, and uh, getting involved with another man as a divorcee was even worse. And so the stigma of being divorced led to Burgos to join the many Puerto Ricans who migrated and have since migrated to the United States, and many of them uh, to New York, which is where she went. That's true. And because of this, the New York Puerto Rican community, known as the New York Ricans, uh, claim uh, Julia as one of their own poets. She would spend the rest of her remaining years mostly in New York City. Well, along these lines of what we've been talking about, Manolo Guzman coined the term, are you ready? Yes. Sexile. Huh. to uh, reference people, mostly homosexual people who have to leave their home and communities on account of uh, sexual orientation. But others, including uh, Julia de Burgos, biographer of Vanessa Perez Rosario, have adapted the term to include women who are marginalized for being sexually transgressive. And that is de Burgos's case. And Julia's family and community opposed her relationship to Grulon. So Burgos left first for East Harlem, but then she followed Grulon to Cuba. Uh, in Cuba, she shared her work with other Latin American writers, including the most illustrious Pablo Neruda, who oh, uh, yes. we we've, we've featured on the, our podcast. He absolutely loved her work. And in fact, it was Neruda who took the initiative to meet Julia. That's exciting. Yeah. He said publicly that Julia was one of the greatest poets of the Americas. Wow. And again, her future really looked promising. While she was there, the Institute of Puerto Rican Literature gave her a literature prize in spite of her personal life, which shocked her. Aww. Yes. Uh, however, the, um, the upward trajectory was kind of short-lived, and it wasn't too long after these highs that her relationship with Gulan deteriorated to the point where one day he came home with a plane ticket for her. She was getting kicked out and sent back at 4 p.m. on the same day that he showed up with a ticket. What a schmuck. He was returning her to New York, and uh, 48 hours after getting this news, she was in New York, tired, hungry, alone, nowhere to go, and $5 in her pocket. So uh, she would marry one more time to a musician by the name of Armando Marin, but that marriage only lasted five years. And this last personal relationship tragedy really took a toll on her. She uh, struggled with alcoholism and depression for the rest of her life. And on July 5th, 1953, in the early morning hours, um, two New York City police officers spotted a body that was unconscious in the street near the corner of Fifth Avenue and 106th Street in East Harlem. It's a mystery to this day as to what happened, but the police rushed her to the Harlem Hospital but she died shortly after midnight of pneumonia and cirrhosis of the liver, which was a result of her alcoholism. And uh, the woman they found had no purse or any form of identification. No one came to claim her body. No missing persons report with her description was filed. So she was buried in a potter's field in New York City. Oh, my gosh. And, and finally, after weeks of looking, looking for her, her friends found her. Her family and friends returned her body to Puerto Rico for a proper burial in her native Carolina. Well, that's just so tragic. And But the story doesn't end there, I don't believe, because irony of ironies, in death, she finally received the recognition that she had tried to get her whole life. Her final collection of poetry, El Mar de Tu, The Sea and You, 
was published after her death by her sister, Consuela. True. Um, in Carolina today, there is a monument erected in her honor. And what's more special than that, there's a bridge over the Rio Grande Luisa that's named after her. The people of Puerto Rico celebrate her life. The University of Puerto Rico awarded her an honorary doctorate in 1987. Uh, but her life is also celebrated in various places across the United States. There are public schools in Puerto Rico, New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago that are named after her. And, and of course, like you mentioned in the beginning, uh, in 2010, the Postal Service commemorated her life with a stamp for Hispanic Heritage Month. The island has embraced its poet. And, and in the words of Saez Burgos, Julia de Burgos not only spoke her reality, she spoke about all of us. So let's finish out by reading this very personal poem, the one that embodies the struggling Julia, the one we can relate to, the one inside. So, Christy, would you read it for us? Sure. To Julia. People now murmur that I am your enemy, for they claim that in verses I reveal your essence to the world. They lie, Julia de Borges. They lie, Julia de Borges. The voice uplifted in my voice verses is not your own. It's mine. For you are garment and I essence. And the greatest abyss lies between the two. You are the cold-blooded puppet of social deceit. And I, the driving splendor of human truth. You, O oh courtesan hypocrisies, the honey, not I, whose heart is revealed in my poems, all. You are like your world, selfish, not I, who dares all to be what I truly am. You are merely the implacable, elegant lady, not I. I am life, I am strength, I am woman. You belong to your husband, to your master, not I. I belong to no one. Or to everyone, because to all, everyone, in wholesome feeling and thought, I give myself. You curl your locks and paint yourself, not I. I am curled by the wind, brightened by the sun. You are homebound, resigned, submissive, confined to the whims of men, not I. I am Roxanate, galloping recklessly, wandering through the boundaries of God's justice. You are not in command of self. Everyone rules you. You are ruled by your husband, your parents, relatives, the priest, the seamstress, theater club, the car, jewels, the banquet, champagne, heaven and hell, and social hearsay. But not me. I am ruled by my heart alone. My sole thought, it is I who rule myself. You, aristocratic blossom, and I, the people's blossom. You are well provided for but are indebted to everyone, while I, my nothingness to no one, oh, you nailed to the stagnate ancestral dividend, and I, but one digit in the social cipher. We are the encroaching, inevitable duel to the death. When the multitude uncontrolled runs, the ashes of injustice burnt, left behind, and when with the torch of the seven virtues the throng to the seven sins gives chase. I will be against you and against all that is unjust and inhuman. Upholding the torch, I shall be among the throng. Hmm. Well, what do you want to say about that? Uh, not really anything. Unlike a Petrarchian sonnet, de Burgos' poetry, like I said, it speaks for itself. It's reason. It's readable. And Julia speaks for herself, and I want her to. I think that's how she would like it. Well, may we extend our respect to one of Puerto Rico's most outspoken women, the beautiful and timeless Julia de Burgos. Uh, copies of these poems are on our website along with the listening guide if you're a teacher looking for classroom materials. Uh, if you are listening for pleasure, please connect with us on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter. And if you'd like to get our little newsletter where we give a blurb about the books or pieces we're highlighting, let us know any way you communicate. And we'd love to add you to our newsletter list. Peace out. <laughs>